Isaiah 54. Now, as you make your way there to Isaiah 54, there's a passage of Scripture found in Paul's letter to the believers at Philippi. And the verse is very, very encouraging. That reminder of Paul's encouragement to them. Philippians 4.4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Here is what we find in this passage of Scripture, an understanding that joy comes from the Lord. When Paul here reminds his readers that there is a reason to rejoice, and that reason is found in who the Lord God, the Lord their God is. We have reason today to rejoice because of who God is, not only in our lives, but in our circumstances not only in our victories, but in our difficulties, not only in our joys, but also in our sorrows, that we have reason ultimately to be what God's called us to be and rejoice because of the Lord God and his goodness and his faithfulness. You know, one of the blessed hopes that we have in this promise is that we know that to have joy in this world is something that cannot be attained. The world offers happiness, and happiness is what we see that is short-lived. But joy, the Bible says, that comes from the Lord. And joy is not short-lived. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of joy as being something that is given by God that is eternal, something we can rest upon, something that we can have an assurance in, because it's the Lord God who gave it to us, the Lord God who leads us in it, and the Lord God who directs us in it. So as Paul here is reminding his uh, fellow believers here at Philippi, and he's admonishing them, encouraging them to rejoice in the Lord. And then he gives this emphasis. He says, and again, I say rejoice. Remember in chapter three of Philippians here, Paul is reminding them on this reason and the hope that they have, that there is this joy. But notice what he says to them. He says, finally, my brethren, and he ends this verse with rejoice in the Lord. This is his familiar theme throughout this epistle here to these believers. And this is a reference that clearly signifies the believers, the Christians sphere that God gives them and is the believers joy. That there is a joy that exists and a sphere unrelated to the circumstances of life. So this is where Paul reminds them that no matter what you go through, you can rejoice because the joy that the Lord God gives to those who believe are not affected by the circumstances of life. Now, understand this very thing that you and I can have a great hope in the Lord our God and rest in these promises that God gives us so we don't lose heart. Amen. So looking now at Isaiah 54, this is the purpose and the means by which we are looking at the text here today. Here, the prophet Isaiah has just gave an amazing prophecy about Jesus's greatest work the work of Christ at Calvary's cross some 750 years before Jesus even comes on the scene. And what we see here is the beauty of God's power and deliverance and redemption for the people of Judah. Then what is the fruit of this? Here is God's gift. Remember what Revelation 13, 8 says is that Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. Isaiah 53 was always a part of God's plan. This is how God would redeem. And then we see in chapter 54, the beauty and the benefits of what takes place because of God's redemptive work. We see here what happens as the result of the sacrifice of Isaiah 53. So notice that in the first verse of chapter 54, he says, sing. Now, this here is an encouragement. This is an invitation to come along. And why do we sing at church? 
Why is there songs written? Because ultimately God's people throughout the ages in the scriptures, you'll see it, always saying songs unto the Lord their God. What does the psalmist say? The psalmist says that it's God who puts a new song in our heart. The picture here that I think is very important is verse 1 of chapter 54 is an invitation to sing about this great work. That the Lord God has provided means for their redemption. And not only for the redemption of the people of Judah, but remember, prophetically, this is speaking to the entirety of humanity. This goes back to the covenant that God made with the people Uh, of Israel through Abraham. And he says, in all the nations of the earth. And he gives them these two pictures of, you know, the sand of the sea, your descendants will be that in number and great in number and the stars in the sky. And, And so we see here that this promise of fruitfulness, this promise of God doing a work through one seed is great. It is mighty. It is, as we can say in these terms, astronomical and the lord even invites he even invites and he challenges him who could number the stars who could number right the the sand of the sea well the answer is no one but this is the promise of god god is the one who does what we think is impossible god says As the scriptures say, Jesus even reiterates this. Is there anything too difficult for our God? So the reason to rejoice is beyond just the thought of, here's something to sing for. No. Once barren, we see here, now there is going to be a supernatural fruitfulness. See, this is by God's doing. So when God works in our lives, you and I today, listen, are recipients of God's grace, recipients of his mercy. And guess what? We do well receiving from the Lord, don't we? But this is why we sing. We come and we sing to the Lord on Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, whenever we have Bible study. And for the most part, we usually try to get a person to come and do a couple of songs before we get in the word. Well, this is the emphasis behind. We have reason to be joyful and rejoice. So remember, Paul says to the Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. You can never get enough rejoicing in the Lord. There's a song that we sing, and from time to time, some of the worship leaders will bring it out, but it's an older song, Um, not really old. It's not a hymn or nothing like that, but... It's one of the older contemporary Christian songs. And the title of the song is, I Can Sing of Your Love Forever. And if you really think about the title of that song, understand the thought behind it. Because of who God is, we should have never-ending rejoicing and singing unto the Lord. So the invitation here is quite fitting. Why? He says, sing, O barren, you who have not borne Break forth in singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Once barren. But he says, now you have reason to rejoice. In other words, the thought here is rejoice. You will no longer be barren. Imagine, we see many stories, right, in the Bible. Some of them, uh, you know, Sarah, uh, some of them, um, you know, Rachel for a moment was, was, you know, struggling to have children. Sarah obviously was barren. And then we also have uh, uh, Hannah, right, Elkanah's wife. And, and remember that these women in their barrenness, God demonstrated a great power. But we know as well the shadow that covered them because of their barrenness. From human perspective, they were cursed by God. They carried that weight of of not being able to bear children. Because remember, when God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, what did he say to them? He says, be fruitful and multiply. So to be fruitful, to bear children, 
in a sense for them, was that's God's blessing upon your life. To not bear children is God's curse upon your life. But now he says, and with these, God did great things through them, right? The Lord used their barrenness, and he used the human perspective, as some call it here, public opinion, right? And God used it for his glory. Because God can bring fruitfulness out of barren things. God can bring great things out of nothing. God can make his greatest creation out of dust. That's who God is. And the Lord is encouraging them, listen to this, because of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who will, notice what it says here. It speaks very clearly of Christ being risen from the dead. It talks about clearly Jesus being raised. That we see here in verse 12 of chapter 53, that Christ though he was numbered with the transgressors, we see here that Jesus ultimately would be raised, that death could not hold him. The grave couldn't keep him captive. And so we see that the picture here is that the suffering servant would be crushed, but he would be raised again. What is the benefit? What is the hope? What is the future in all of this? Well, now as we speak to ourselves in this, I could imagine the people of Judah on a great high. What's going to come out of all of this? Well, you will no longer be barren. You have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge. He says, the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtain of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Notice the picture here of, he says, you were once barren, but you're now going to be fruitful. And he's saying, get prepared for this. Enlarge. You know, sometimes when we only have small amounts, if you will, or we only think in small terms. We prepare in those terms. Why would uh, a people barren be prepared like a people who are going to have a lot? In other words, he's saying, my promise to you is I will bring you out of your barrenness. I will make you fruitful. And because I said this, I want you to prepare now for it. So be ready to receive. Enlarge, he says, the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtain of your dwellings. I love that. So in other words, he says here, don't hold back. Do not hold back. Your fruit will be so great, it will stagger your imagination. That's the thought behind the word enlarge. In other words, expect great things from the Lord your God. Remember, we often say this kind of as a, just a phrase in ministry, but it's so true that if you don't come with an attitude of expectancy, you're not going to receive. We should always be expecting from the Lord God that his word is what it says it is. It's alive, it's living, it's powerful. If you truly believe that, then God's word has its perfect work in you. We're able to receive what the Lord might have for us. And in all of this here, the Lord is saying, prepare yourself for the fruitfulness and the barrenness is going to be gone. But this is God's promise. Now, if we look at this historically, basically, in essence, what God is saying is he's going to deliver them from their captivity, 70 years of captivity, them not being able to worship, them not even being in the land of Israel. And God is saying, you're going to go back. And he even goes a little bit further to talk about a city that is great and beautiful. And he speaks concerning the city, but he also speaks concerning the people. And yes, historically and contextually, this is talking about Judah coming out of Babylonian captivity, going back into the land and God using them and blessing them. But also Paul emphasizes that this text also has an allegorical overtone as it pertains to new believers in the faith. 
when you look at all of this here, you begin to see what's really important. Two things that we gather from all of this that the Lord is encouraging the people is expect great things from me. And secondly, we see in verse 3, attempt to do great things for me. You see, it's one thing to expect it. It's another thing to take that expectation and then take steps of faith, attempt to do great things. Really think about this, guys, because this is kind of what it's coming out to be. So look at it in the context of you and me. How fruitful are we? You know, we have this this weird Christianity where, you know, people really think they bring their gifts to the table. We have this weird Christianity that people really believe that that they have something to do with their work of salvation that is supernatural and spiritual. You bring nothing to the table but your sin. You were barren, unfruitful. This is what Jesus said in John 15, 16. He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Any fruitfulness in our life is a gift of God. Don't take credit for it. You see, the beauty of all of this is not a matter of who gets credit for how good I am now that I'm saved. It's more of how faithful God is that he took that which was once dead in me, separated from him, restored it, brought it to life and using it now for his honor and for his glory. And what I've become now is not only a child of God, but the product of his power, his sovereignty, his grace, his forgiveness, his redemption, and his mercy. Look at the beauty here that the Lord is saying to them. You have been like a barren woman who has not given birth. Remember that the story of Elkanah, you know, in his... And his dilemma, right, with his wife, you know, is he had more than one wife, right? And, 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 and this is Samuel's mom. Remember, this is the first prophet of the Lord for, or excuse me, the first uh, priest and, and uh, uh, prophet of the Lord for the people of Israel in that sense. He worked in those two dynamics. And, 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 and the Lord used him greatly in that picture. But, you know, God used him tremendously in the worship of the Lord in, you know, because the priestly order was messed up, right? I mean, that was his first prophecy, right? He, he, he was a prophet to the people, but he also started his prophetic ministry where? In the tabernacle of the Lord, right? He's, he's, he's speaking to, to Eli, right? And he's telling him in his first word to him, you're in sin, your sons are in sin, and you need to take care of this because the sacred things... As, as, as the ministry, if you will, in a sense, his priestly ministry, not after the order of Aaron, but ordained by God to, to officiate that. What happened? <clears throat> the glory of the Lord departed because of man's sinfulness. But how was this, how was this prophet birthed? It was birthed out of, he was birthed out of adversity, out of barrenness. And one of the promises that was that was made was that Hannah prayed and she said, Lord, if you give me a child, I will give him to you. I will give him back to you. And she kept her end of the vow, right? Out of barrenness, God brought forth a leader in Israel. And it was amazing. It was it was a power. Listen to this. The time of the prophets had yet to begin. Samuel was the birther of the school of the prophets. And from that point on, you see the ministry of prophets begin. You know, ultimately, when God led them out of their captivity, the Lord, you know, he brought them out of that captivity in Egypt, led by Moses, then by Joshua. And After that, we have the time of the judges. The people were led by the judges. After the time of the judges, the people were led by the kings. And after the time of the kings, they were led by the prophets. And in all of this here, we see that 
the Lord created something, but oftentimes we don't realize the power of what God, you know, when I look at the story of this and I say, man, you know, this woman was crying out to the Lord. Nobody understood her. Even Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk and crazy, right? This poor drunk woman. But you know what? From the outside looking in, Elkanah never even believed that Hannah could have had any children. It shows by his gifts towards her. He would give her more than his other wives that had children, right? He, he would try to treat her very special because in his mind he says, poor thing, she can't have kids. But all the while, God was doing a work. God was showing not only Hannah. God was not only showing Elkanah. God was not only showing Eli. God was showing the nation of Israel. I am the one who can create things out of barrenness. God's not intimidated, nor is he affected by this barrenness. As a matter of fact, God uses it. Just like you and I, who were not fruitful people before. What type of fruit were you bearing before you came to Christ? None. But God took that fruitlessness in you. God took the barrenness spiritually in you. And today we bear fruit because of who Christ is. Right? And it's evident that us who were once barren now are able to bear fruit and the promise here to the people of Judah is they will no longer be barren. And in verse 2, the encouragement is get ready. Get ready. For anybody that has walked with the Lord long enough, listen to this. And when I say walk with the Lord long enough, I mean for anyone who has come to the Lord and truly has allowed God to work. Many people come to Jesus. Very few allow the work of God to be displayed through their life. Many come to Jesus. They know what it is to go to church. They know what it is to, to pray and read. They know what it is to do what we call the daily regimen. But to take all of that prayer, to take all of that reading, to take all of what you take in and humble yourself and let God now work through your life where you have no say. The problem is we have a lot of say. We start to tell God, well, I want to do this for you and I want to do that for you and I want to go here for you and I want to go there for you and I want to do it this long and I only want to do it that long. And let me tell you something, when you get on that, going back to weird Christianity, because now it's about your abilities rather than God's faithfulness and his power in and through your life, you miss the bigger picture. Then your Christian walk is miserable. It's miserable. Now listen. The imperfections of God's servants in the Bible is not a reason for our backslidings. This is another thing. Hey, listen. Yes, Jeremiah 3. I, the Lord your God, am married to the backslider. But he's talking about Israel's backslidings. And they were great. And their backsliding was because they continued to what? Worship idols, right? That was the number one thing of their backsliding. So when we backslide and we know that God is married to, our, to us, even in our backslidden condition, to backslide doesn't mean you lose your salvation. That, that, that's another weird Christianity that people have. When we say backslider, right away, everybody starts thinking of somebody that's not here. Okay? Oh, man, yeah. Oh, they backslid. Listen, if you don't love Jesus more today than you did yesterday, you're already backslidden in your heart. We backslide daily. But because there is a backslidden condition in our human nature, our flesh, we don't say things like, well, you know, God's people ain't perfect. No, of course we're not. But it's not an excuse to not humble yourself. To say, Lord, 
I got ahead of you or Lord, I try to be Lord in my life. And then you wonder why we do so good for a period of time. We fall off. We're back. We're forth. See, all of this, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is to know that you were once barren, but now you're producing fruit. You were once separated from God, but now you're brought near. And guys, listen to this. The Lord is saying, yes, you were captive for 70 years, but now you're going to be back in the land. So in other words, what he's saying to them is, listen, prepare for many offsprings. You say, whoa, wait, 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 this is way, this is, whoa, this is way too much. How do I go from not having nothing to now you're telling me I'm going to have everything? You want to know what? Sometimes we don't know how to act. Right. And it's often been said that when the Lord begins to bless us, when the Lord begins to listen, don't take the blessings of God and make them a curse in your life. Because we do that. God starts working in you. God starts blessing you. And you want to know what I'm saying? You, at first, it's like, oh, yeah, this is the Lord. Praise God. And after a while, you take those things that were of the Lord. Praise God. And you're no longer walking with the Lord and praising God. You forget. Your focus and your worship now becomes the blessing rather than the blesser. And let me tell you guys, in all of this here, the Lord is saying, when the blessings come, they will continue. Therefore, his honor for his glory. This is not a prosperity message. This is not a, hey, guys, believe God only for blessings. No, this is the Lord saying, I will take you out of your fruitless, barren life. And I will bless you and use you for my honor and for my glory. I love what he says. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Isn't that awesome? So two things, once again, as I stated earlier. Number one, when he says here, do not spare and lengthen your cords, jot this down in your notes. Expect great things from the Lord your God. Now this is all within the Lord dealing with his people as they Turn to the Lord as their time of captivity is done. And the Lord is saying, listen, now here's an opportunity for you to walk with me with all of your heart. Expect great things from the Lord. And then he says, for you shall expand to the right and to the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. In other words, now attempt to do great things for God. You know that we have the privilege of doing great things for the Lord. We really do. And the enemy would love to get in there and stifle it and distract you and discourage you. But, you know, you stay the course. Don't lose heart. Attempt to do great things for the Lord. What I often tell people is this, is they say, well, you know, I want to go here. I want to do this. I want to do that. I said, those things are great. But the greatest thing you could ever do for the Lord your God in your walk with him is obey his word. Obey his word. See, you could speak his word. You could memorize his word. You can understand his word. Very few can exposit his word. Because we do live in a day and age where everybody, you know, this other weird Christianity. Well, you know, you get the interpretation from that verse. I get this interpretation. No. Exegetical and expository teaching leaves no room for different interpretations of a verse. We don't serve a double-minded God or a confused God. What his word says is what it says. Simple as that. But the beauty of all of this here, guys, is the Lord is saying in this, we can attempt to do great things for God. Listen to this. Because God desires to do great things through us. You can be used by God in ways that are beyond your ability to even begin to think or comprehend. But obedience to his word is what brings these things about. 
To obey God's word is the greatest and highest glory you could give the Lord your God. And I want to help you guys with this. Why? Because there is a fear that man has. And the fear is waiting on God. Think about this for a moment. God is at work. There's no doubt about that. God never stops working. We know that, right? God even encourages his people and he reminds them in his word that he doesn't stop working and never will stop working. He says in Psalm 121, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Listen to this. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. There's never a time where God takes a break. <laughs> How many times have we said, I need a break? See, this is, this, is the, this is the beauty that we have. This is what God is encouraging them with. And he's saying, listen, are you prepared for what I'm about to do? I see a lot of us come into this and we're not prepared because some of us don't even realize this is what God wants to do. Through our obedience to his word, God gets the greatest glory out of his children. Notice what Paul the apostle says here. I love this. Galatians chapter 4. And I love this picture here because Paul kind of takes the text here of Isaiah 54. He actually quotes verse 1 of Isaiah 54. And, and notice how Paul starts off this thing. He's on the topic here in the book of Galatians, on the topic of the two covenants. And he goes on to say this in verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman, but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic, he says. <laughs> They're symbolic. Notice that Paul here discerns what the prophet Isaiah is speaking. He says, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. In other words, Hagar is symbolically, as he said, it's symbol. Symbolically, Hagar represents the law. She represents the Jews who do not put their trust in Christ because the context is the gospel in the book of Galatians. It's not the Old Testament law. It's Christ. You know, when Paul ministered to the churches of Galatia, you have several churches. This is not just one group of people. Remember, Paul ministered in the regions of northern and southern Galatia, many churches. And one of the things he said to them is who they are. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai and in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Why is Jerusalem in bondage with her children? He says it right here, because of the law, because of the rejection of the Messiah. So if they marry themselves to the law, then they are what? Under the law. Look at what happens here. He goes on to say, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, today, there are some people that have come knocking on your door. Some of you here this morning have already experienced them. They come preaching to you a gospel that is different than the gospel of the word. It's a false gospel. And they ask you if you've heard of God the Father. We sang he's a good, good father. And you most likely will say yes. And then they'll say, have you heard of God the mother? Their main headquarters is in Korea. But they have established very large churches. World Mission Society, the largest one here locally, is off the 210 freeway in Barton Road. Many Christians 
will engage in conversation with these people. And it's sad because every Christian I've heard to try to debate these does not even properly exposit the passage of Galatians 4, where they say, you see, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. This is their foundational verse to prove that there is a God the mother. And there's not. Whatsoever. Notice the context of the passage. Listen to this. Here, Paul quotes from Isaiah 54 and verse 1. Is the prophet Isaiah speaking about God the mother there? Okay, obviously not. What is it speaking about? It's speaking about, listen, extend your tent, man. Get ready because you're going to bear much fruit. He says, you're going to extend into other areas, other nations. He had just promised them in chapters 52 and 50 and 51 that what? Salvation is going to come to the Gentiles. It's going to expand. It's going to be great. It's going to be big. This is God's. How is all this going to happen? Isaiah 53, the suffering servant will come and he will prepare the way. So now rejoice. You're going to be brought out of your captivity. You're going to be greater than you ever thought you could be. Your barrenness is now going to be fruitful. And he goes on to say here, there are going to be many. And look at what Paul says. Paul is reaching back to the prophet Isaiah and he's pulling it into the New Testament. And what is he saying here? For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Notice what he's saying here now. He says, this is going to be great. Jesus said in the Gospels, I have sheep that are not of this Old. So you have the false teachers of the World Mission Society claiming Galatians 4.4 4, that there's a God the mother. Then when Jesus says, I have sheep that are not of this fold, you have the false teaching of Mormonism saying that the Mormons are the other fold. You have the discreet slave in Matthew's gospel. The Jehovah's Witnesses claiming that they are the discreet slave. And so their world in track society, their headquarters in New York is the only interpreter of the Bible. And so they produce these magazines to keep people fixated on their false teaching. When in none of these times, listen to this, this is why I say there's such weird stuff out there. And Christians eat this stuff up all the time. Because they don't know the Lord their God. They're not bearing fruit in righteousness. They're not bearing fruit in discernment. They're not bearing fruit in understanding the word of God. And I love this. What Paul is simply saying here is those who believe in Christ have been supernaturally born again. And are children of the mother city, Jerusalem above. It's the same thing that God told Abraham when he said, look at the stars so shall your descendants be. It's supernatural. It's a work that only God can do. God told Mary, that which is conceived in you is conceived of the Holy Spirit. It was a supernatural thing. It was miraculous. The church, the body of Christ is a supernatural thing. Listen to this. And this is why the promise of Isaiah 54 to the people of Judah that were captive for 70 years. He said, listen, you guys thought you were done. You're going to be more fruitful than you ever have been. A supernatural thing. And guess what he says? Not only is it going to be your descendant, it's going to go beyond your, your people. He's saying that this is what Isaiah 53 will culminate in. It's not just for your salvation. It's for salvation of humanity. You guys see the bigger picture here? Isn't that something to be excited about? You guys don't look too excited this morning. I don't know if it's because it's Father's Day or what. But my goodness, when I looked at this this morning, I says, wow, I looked at verse 28. I says, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. In other words, when it says that Jerusalem, the city, he uses this weird play on words allegorically. Paul does here, and it is. It's a weird mixture of words. But he says, the city now is our mother. Supernaturally, yes. Paul says the same thing in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says, your citizenship is where? In heaven. 
This is all he's saying here. And you know what's interesting? How many of you guys have ever heard of the great missionary William Carey? Anybody ever heard? You guys need to start reading biographies on missionaries. You know, when he preached his sermon out of Isaiah 54, you know what he said? Isaiah 54 is talking about worldwide missions. And people thought he was tripping until he said, Paul the Apostle taught me that. Because in Galatians 4, Paul is talking about the gospel going to all who believe in Christ. He's not talking about the church becoming spiritual Israel because that's not true. The church does not replace Israel. Replacement theology is a lie. God's covenant with Israel is not done. I read to you guys last week, Romans chapter 11, right? Didn't I read to you guys that? Verse 29, the gifts and callings of God are what? Irrevocable. And a lot of us apply that to ourselves. But that's not talking about you. God's talking about Israel. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 pertains to Israel. A lot of people say, oh, you know, hey, God's, you know, his gifts and callings are irrevocable. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. Yes, because God said his gifts and callings for Israel are irrevocable. We, as children of God, can rejoice in the fact that if God is faithful to Israel, even in their rebellion and their disobedience, and says, I'm not done with you, how much more us? Who have accepted his son Jesus? Because in verse 25 of Romans 11, he says, blindness in part has come upon them. You're not blind. They are. And there has to come a time for the Lord, like he did with Saul, to remove the scale from their eyes so now they can see Jesus for who he is. And that day is going to come. The Bible says it's going to happen. I wish I can be there, but I'll be looking from heaven's vantage point. And they're going to say, who did this to you? And Jesus, as the prophet Zechariah states on more than one occasion, is going to say, you did. Then Israel will see Jesus like you and I have seen him. And this is all Paul is talking about. Listen, they're rejecting, so they're under the law. Guys, you see this? You cannot practice law and say that you have the Holy Spirit. Because what did Paul say? The letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. Listen to what else he says, above which there is no Wow. We are not born of the bondwoman. We are born of the free woman. Think about this, guys. When I look at all this, I say, man, this should have been our Mission Sunday message. My goodness. But let's move on. I want to give you guys something to be excited about. I know if I had a bowl of menudo out there waiting for you, you'd be rejoicing right now. Some of you need to enlarge today because you're not enlarging. Some of you come to church and this is what you do. You come to church and listen, I'm not going to look at anybody right now because I don't want you to think I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to you. Okay, listen, you come to church, your hands hanging in, looking like Eeyore. Yeah, me. You, you hear the message, you sing praises to God, you walk out of church, me. listen, it's by the grace of God that he looks at you and he rejoices. You know, the Bible says that the Lord rejoices over us with singing. How many of you love to sing to the Lord? You couldn't carry a tune if it had a handle, but you make it happen, don't you? Listen. What if I told you that God sings over you? What would you give just to hear God sing? And he sings over you. And he rejoices over you. And then you're over here like, nobody, nobody loves me. I mean, really think about this. This is what the Lord is saying. You guys need to get ready because I'm going to do this. Now you attempt to do great things. And you might say, I want to do great things for God. I always get this all the time in here. People pet me and prime me and pat me on the pastor Dave. And oh man, and God and this and that. I'm just like, well, that's all good. But are you obedient to his word? Because if not, you ain't going to get nowhere. You ready for this? Verse 4, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Man. Is it, what, what do we do? Right away, we're like, wait, 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 wait. To enlarge, to get ready, that means I got to cut loose some things. I got to 
I got, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, 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 wait here. Lord, you see my life. Yes, I need you, but I don't need you. But I do need you, but I love this. But I do love you, but I kind of want this. But I kind of want you. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't fear what you're going to lose. Rejoice in what you're going to gain. You know, people, the prayer of Jabez, you guys remember that? <laughs> they were like, hey, pastor, you got to pray the prayer of Jabez. I ain't going to pray no prayer of Jabez. I'm going to pray that for, Lord, enlarge my territories. And like, for what? If God has that in his purpose, in his will for my life, so be it. If he doesn't enlarge these territories the little bit, listen, if all Jesus came to do was forgive me of my sins and die on the cross for me, he's done more than enough. I have all that I need just in him. If God wants to give me anything else, that's to his discretion, not mine. Half the time, I don't even know what to do with the blessings that God gives me. We squander them off like a child receiving his inheritance from his parents. We become spoiled and selfish. We begin to think it's because of our doing rather than the Lord's faithfulness. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. He's telling the people of Israel, listen, when, I, listen, when you go free and you go there, don't look back and be like, yeah, we're all messed up, man. Okay, God, you brought us here, but... We're, we're just, you know, you know that, that, that uh, false humility in Christianity where people come to church and like, we're just so unworthy. We're just so unworthy. You're always going to be unworthy. True humility is submission to his word. It doesn't come in words. It comes in action. Look at what he's saying. Your time of disgrace is over, so stop acting like you're still a disgraceful thing. Because sometimes our past does that. It traps us in that, right? I mean, think about how I would say things like if, you know, something bad happened, you know, or difficulty in life, and then I just look in the mirror as your pastor, and you guys see me looking in the mirror, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just a dope fiend, man. You know, I guess I'll always be one. You guys would be like, pastor, what's wrong with you, right? No? No? Okay, you guys got me worried there for a second. It's Father's Day, be nice. That's why when I hear people say, I'm so dumb, anybody that knows me when they say that, I tell them, stop saying that. Because you're not. You just look like it. No, I'm just kidding. No, I just, you're not. You know why that bothers me? You know why that bothers me? Because my dad always told me I was dumb. He had a certain word that for some of you is a curse word. But that's what he called me. Somebody who I always wanted to be like. Somebody who I always pursued but never gave me the time or day. Until a couple of months before he died. Now I thank God for the many men that he put in my life that were fathers to me but I only had one dad and listen to this this is why I tell people you're not dumb you close your mouth put your tongue back in there close it. you're not dumb you may be ignorant of some things ignorance is not stupidity it's just not knowing not having enough information the people get saved, they become Christians, and all of a sudden they still think they're what they were. No, you have been delivered. You might have been done before. <laughs> your time of disgrace is over, he says, for your maker. Think about that, your maker, the one who fashioned you. Guys, listen to this. Who is this maker? Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1, verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord, 
and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. I love that. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, listen to this, and for him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Do you see now it's for his glory? That is your maker, he's telling the people of Israel. Once rejected, listen to this, now restored. Behold, church, your God. He goes on to say here, not only is he your maker, he is your husband, Israel. You're married to God. The church is the bride of Christ as it pertains to the fruit of the gospel. The Lord of hosts, the one who will fight for you, the Lord of armies is his name. Listen to this. Is his name and your redeemer, the one who redeems, the one who buys you back because you belong to him first. Is the holy one of Israel, the sacred and pure one. He is called the God of the whole earth, the creator of all things, sovereign over everything. You see, Israel was once rejected because of their idolatry. And the Lord is saying in all of this, this is why I dealt with you the way that I did, but I am the Lord your God. Enlarge, in other words, he says, prepare. I love that. Prepare yourself to receive. Rejoice, prepare, receive. Do not fear, he says. Verse 6 says, For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken, grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused. Israel rejected due to idolatry. For a mere moment I have forsaken you. Yes, 70 years of captivity. Yes. We need to reject idols rather than reject the Lord our God. Remember, that's what Romans chapter 1, verse 25 is all about. He says, but with great mercies, I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with the everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. I love this. The Lord God has tenderly restored them. God didn't say, get over here. Ah, you know, like a parent upset with a kid that dirtied their clothes. Cute little kid, right? You ever see parents do that with them? Get over here. Start pulling their shirt all rough. Little kid just like, get their pants. Look at what you did. There's... Imagine if God restored us now. Get over here. Pulled you by the ear. But no, the Lord tenderly. He tenderly. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. Look at this, verse 9. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. Didn't he make that promise? By what sign? So have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. When people give you this image of an angry God who's striking you down. No, listen, he's a loving and gracious God. Then you say, well, why why, why do I feel like this? Well, one, it's conviction. And number two, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences of your sin. God will forgive you of your sins, but your consequences will still be there. You brought those consequences. You want those consequences to go away? Here's the answer. They're not. They won't. Consequences are the result of our disobedience. You might say, well... That conviction is very strong. Well, the Bible says very clearly that God chastens those whom he loves. That's what Hebrews 12 is all about, right? Read it. And anybody who is not chastened is illegitimate, the Bible says. But he who is chastened by God, that means corrected, not God angry. God like a parent. The Lord here tenderly restores them. I love this here. 
For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. O you afflicted one, tossed and tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundation with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies and your gates of crystal and all your walls of precious stones. That reminds me of Revelation 21, doesn't it? Beautiful. New Jerusalem. A city once desolate will be beautiful and secure by the promise and restoration of God. So what is he saying? Your past afflictions, oh, you afflicted one, tossed in tempest, and you were not comforted? Look at what he says. Look. Behold, I will lay your stones. You're going to be immovable. Your future is glory. Look at this. I will make your pinnacles of rubies. All of this stuff here. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Wow. Now this will be fulfilled where? In the millennial kingdom. So this is prophecy now looking way ahead. But you see what he's telling them? Enlarge your tent. And attempt to do great things for the Lord God. The people say, how can you enlarge your tent when gas prices are really high? <laughs> how can you enlarge your tent when this country is going down and everything's going in shambles and inflation's through the roof and you guys are watching too much news? Stop tripping, man. That's the Greek word for being a weirdo. <laughs> Trust the Lord your God. And know that a day is going to come when Jesus himself will come and teach our children. What a promise. Isn't that amazing? A great, look at this, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble. But not because of me, whoever assembles against me, you shall fall for your sake. Behold, again, he says, look, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument of his work. So he says to them, your past afflictions are over. Here is your future glory. Your future glory with the Lord will look as this. Look at what he says here. And I have created the destroyer to destroy the spoiler. He calls it, but you need not to worry. The ones who reject will not bear fruit, will not have reason to rejoice, but you have not rejected, you have trusted. Don't let your past keep you in prison. Enlarge your tent, man. Stretch out. Look at what he says here. Enlarge your tent and stretch out. He says, go as far as to the right and to the left. Your descendants are going to inherit. Listen to this. The nations. Not nation of Israel, the nations. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Where does your righteousness come from? The child of God lives in constant victory. So go, he says. Live in your freedom, live in your security, and victory in the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. He's encouraging them and he's saying, listen, there's no need to second guess what you have. There's no need for you to worry about these things. And as he says this, he says to them very clearly that as the city of Jerusalem pertains to them, he says, listen, no enemy is going to completely wipe you out. No weapon formed against you. The Lord created the destroyer to wreak havoc. God's in control. You're rising up and you're going down is all by God's doing. And guys, I want to encourage you today to live for the Lord in obedience to his word. Be prepared for God to do great things in your life. Be prepared for God. Listen, and for some of us, we might just have to simply do what the people of Judah did. Turn to the Lord their God with all of their heart and say, Lord, forgive me. I need to walk in obedience to your word. You have great things for me. Everything that we read here was all good for them. He wasn't saying, now, you know, listen, you're going to get that, but you're going to go. No, he says, listen, the way I made a covenant with, with Noah on his day that I would not destroy the earth. Listen, 
I promise you, my kindness will be with you. Go walk in that. Rejoice in that. And let nobody steal your joy. Amen?